Dogman saved us from the tool using Sasquatch. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a story about the Wisconsin Dogman, a tool using Midwestern Bigfoot, and the time my girlfriend and I decided we should become man and wife. It's the story we told our kids, and we hope to tell our new grandson when he gets old enough to be interested in stories about cryptids and his old grandparents. Now, I promise to get right to us camping in Dogman territory in the next paragraph or two, but I need to speed through some background info about us first. We were in our early 20s, but Diane and I had already had multiple partners by that point, and we were looking to have a more serious relationship than we'd been able to have prior. The two of us had met at a dance club, and through that time that we were dating, we had really only seen each other glammed up, and we'd only really been on our best behavior with each other. We were very excited by, and attracted to, each other, but we were very scared to get more committed because we'd both been burned before. One of the coincidences we shared was that we had both lost our best friends after we went camping with them. Camping can be stressful sometimes, when you least expect it to be, and it can sure test a friendship. We were both very hurt, when the people we thought were our best friends rejected us after fights that started while we were camping together. We both knew what this meant. If we were going to find out if we were really meant to get married, and if our marriage might work, then we were going to have to test it. We were going to have to go camping together. Not for a weekend. Not for a week. But we were going to have to schedule out two weeks of time to try to survive together out in nature. No fancy makeup and high heels for her. No nice clothes or shaving for me. We were gonna have to risk spending time with each other and smelling each other's body odor, not perfumes and after shave lotions. When we first started planning out our camping trip, it was like planning a funeral. We were so scared that we were gonna lose each other that it became hard to do. This was the later 1990s, and at one point Diane said as a joke that we should go to Puerto Rico and camp someplace where we could look for the chupacabra. That joking around morphed into a more serious conversation, with us talking about going legend tripping closer to our home in Michigan. We had been reading about the Wisconsin werewolf and the beast of Bray Road, so we planned on camping in that area in our adjoining state for a couple weeks. We had no idea at the time that we had a number of locations right in our own state of Michigan where people had been reporting the same kind of large canines and upright walking dogs for generations. So in our ignorance, we thought we had to drive over to our neighboring state of Wisconsin for our adventure. So once it turned into a legend trip, I have to say our spirits lightened and we both started to look forward to going camping. We eventually settled on going to Camp Dewan which is about a 20-minute drive to the northeast of the original Bray Road Dogman sightings in the 1990s. There are other campgrounds closer to Bray Road, but they aren't set in a forest, and so to us, they just weren't spooky looking enough. This was being planned by us at a time where I'm not sure we really actually believed in the Dogman's true existence. I think back then we just thought we were cool when we said we believed in Dogman, that's all. It was sort of like the punk rock 90s version of believing in Santa Claus. So when my girlfriend actually saw Dogman one early morning before either I or the sun had gotten up yet, she was pretty much in awe. It was the legend come to life, and she reacted in a way that neither of us had anticipated. What Diane did was, she tossed him some of our sandwich meats. When I woke up from her shouting, and she told me this, I was not happy. You're supposed to hide your food from the local dangerous predators. You're not supposed to leave your tent and go throw meat at them. She told me I was being a grouch, and anyway, she can't throw very well, so the meat was still sitting there on the grass. I walked out over there and I looked. Sure enough, there were slices of ham scattered on the dirt, about 10 to 15 feet from the edge of camp. I had to laugh. 
But as I laughed, a huge dogman rose up out of the bushes about 20 feet away and casually walked in my direction. Let me pause the action and explain what I mean when I say a huge dogman. He was not as big as some of the creatures you have in some of your stories, but I'm five foot ten, and he must have been six and a half feet tall. So to me, that's huge. His fur was an orangey brown, and fairly solid all over. So I didn't initially read him as a wolf. I suppose his face was like a wolf, or a dog, or maybe a fox. But it was that orangey brown color all over solid. And so I wasn't really sure what I was seeing. He had a chest and belly like a very athletic human male. But it was covered in thick fur. And this was clearly not a human being at all. The legs looked canine when it walked upright on its toes. But then when it stopped to stand and look at me, it dropped from walking on its tiptoes to sort of standing more like a human. I mean that first lowest section in the dog leg sort of functioned as the heel in a human type foot when it would stop walking and stand still. I remember noticing these odd details because my mind was telling me that this cannot be real and my eyes were arguing back showing me that it was real and showing me how it was real. It walked this way. It stood that way. You don't notice things like that in dreams and hallucinations. Those kinds of details are the products of actuality happening in front of you. I had asked the universe to please let me see a dogman. Yet when the universe complied, I was not emotionally prepared at all. And my nervous system became quickly overwhelmed with the realization that sometimes in life, you get exactly what you wish for. That creature towered over me even before I fell on my behind and covered my eyes and my family jewels, then screamed like a little girl. I thought the thing was gonna come eat me alive, but when I opened my eyes again, I saw he was picking up the slices of ham, and he was giving me a pained expression as he walked away. I got the impression that my screaming in fear like a little baby had hurt his sensitive canine ears. All he wanted was the ham, my future wife informed me trying to remain patient, the next time you tell me that women get dramatic, I'm going to remind you of how you fell over and weeped because a big dog wanted some ham. I then realized I was still covering my privates with my hand, then I stopped. But I want it clear for the record that I did not weep, as she stated. That was an exaggeration on her part, I swear. Now, while I was shocked and stunned by our experience, Diane wanted to pack up camp and go live in the woods for the rest of our two weeks. She wanted to go off the grid, as my kids call it, leave the official campground and expose ourselves to a higher percentage of a chance to see that dog man again. This felt like a terrible mistake to me, and I started to get one of my famous stomach aches. And I was pretty much miserable for the rest of the time we were out there, but I went along with what Diane wanted. I already knew by then that I was lost, and I was going to do it her way, for the rest of my life. I just like her too much. Even when she has ideas that place us directly in danger, her enthusiasm about those decisions is something I would never want to smother or dampen. When Diane gets excited, the entire world comes alive, and I just sort of see my job as helping her to keep her joy going as long as possible. You can't take happiness and laughter for granted. You gotta keep planting more of those seeds and you got to keep watering the ones you've already planted. Diane let me sleep off my severe emotional trauma for one day. Then we packed up our tent and off we trekked into the woods with zero modern equipment on us at all. Correction, Diane tells me we had a compass. That means she had the compass because I don't remember that part. At any rate, I was in a horrible mood wondering if I was either going to kick the bucket or get myself severely injured by a cryptid during this camping trip. By a cryptid I didn't believe in a month earlier. I had a bad feeling about the entire thing, and I had a hopeless feeling too. 
I had never felt so exposed or frightened in my life. And I doubted that my clearly very brave girlfriend was going to miss the fact that I was terrified. I wanted to go home so badly. And yet, she was walking out into the woods that we had seen that dogman go into. I didn't want my fear to show. I was supposed to be the bigger and the braver one. So I had to start acting like it. It wasn't the first night, but one of those nights. I woke up in the darkness, feeling cold, and finding Diane missing from the tent. I looked outside, and I swear, I saw her in the moonlight, walking slowly over to that same big old dogman, holding something out to him. I wasn't sure, but it looked like she had more of that ham in her hand. My heart started racing. That dogman might bite her hand right off without even meaning to. His snout was bigger than Diane's entire head. I started climbing out of the tent as I saw that dogman curl his lips back and reveal rows of teeth probably as big as bowling pins. I was lightheaded. I was panicking. I stood up and saw that dogman lean down and very delicately take the slice of ham using only the very ends of his hunting dagger teeth and gently pull it from Diane's fingers as though they had been practicing this for a stage show. Maybe they had, for all I knew. I wanted to go over to her, but I no longer thought she was in danger. I felt like if I went over there, I might be in danger, though. It seemed that the wisest path for me would be to stand still, remain as quiet as I could, and just observe what was happening. The dogman ate that slice of ham, and I wondered what it would do next when there was a scream that sounded strangely human erupting from the woods beyond that dogman and my girlfriend. This time Diane screamed, and she ran in my direction as the six-and-a-half-foot orange-brown dogman turned to face a far larger bipedal creature that looked kind of like an upright-standing gorilla, but stretched up much taller. This creature was bigger than a bear when it stands. I know that much. As the dogman towered over me, this creature towered over the dogman. Its fur was black with gray and bluish highlights, and its eyes were bright red with absolute hatred. More even than the size and the strength of that beast, the sheer anger of it was terrifyingly impressive. It made fists and pounded the ground so hard that I could feel it where I was standing. What was it so angry about? It was angry at the dogman, but why? Diane ran past me and back into the tent. Then she came out of the tent, pushed me into it, and climbed inside to join me. He's jealous, she informed me. It took me a minute to understand that she meant the huge dark Bigfoot throwing a fit out there. He was jealous that she gave ham to the dogman? Diane tells me that yes, that is what she meant. The Bigfoot saw her giving the food to the dogman, and he erupted in rage. She says she never saw that Bigfoot before, but it's possible that it had been watching us ever since we entered the forest. By the way, a lot of Bigfoot people will tell you that if there is one Bigfoot in a scene, there are at least several others hidden in that scene as well. I have come to accept that this is a general rule for Sasquatches, but I do think that there are some young adult males who go it alone before they find a mate. I think that this was one of those, a loner, and that might explain some of his overly aggressive and jealous behavior. I could be completely wrong, obviously. I don't claim to be an anthropologist or a biologist. Certainly if there were other squatches there, they never came to this big one's aid, and nobody had his back. When we peeked out of the tent at the action, my first impression was that I was watching some kind of epic mythic battle. The dogman reminded me of Captain America, and the Bigfoot was like the Hulk in comparison. Like the dogman looked muscular until you looked at that Sasquatch. It seemed to be an overmatch in favor of the furiously angry Bigfoot, and then he reached down 
and picked something up that tripled the odds in his favor. From somewhere on the ground to his side, the Bigfoot picked up what looked to me like a spear. Diane argues this point with me. She says it was just a long stick that had broken off a tree in such a way as to have a sharp end on one side. To me, it looked like that end had been shaven down to a point, but it was dark out, and we were not right on the action. So for all I know, we were both wrong, and it was some third kind of an object. What we can both agree on, though, is that the Bigfoot picked this long, sharp-ended stick up, and however it had been made, he used it as a spear. He held it with both hands and made jabbing motions toward the dogman, who had to keep leaping out of the way of the dangerous natural spear. So whether that Bigfoot created the spear or found it randomly, nobody can argue that he was using it as a tool and as a weapon. That would seem to display a higher kind of intelligence, at least according to some of my generation's way of measuring the natural world. Of course, it's also been shown that crows use tools to capture and eat ants, so maybe it's more common in the animal world than we can know. The dogman appeared to be about to be savagely crushed in front of our eyes, and it was clear whose side my girlfriend was on. She crawled past me out of that tent and began crazily trying to throw small rocks at the Bigfoot. None of them even got halfway toward him, and this time it was my turn to push her back inside the tent. This wasn't our battle. This was the dogman's battle. He was going to have to win or lose this one on his own. I told her we needed to get back into the tent for our own safety, and she went back inside. But as we lay there on our bellies looking at the fighting going on outside, Diane became more and more convinced that once that Bigfoot destroyed her dogman friend, he was going to come over and pitch a fit over us, too. He was going to want all the ham. And he was going to want to punish her for sharing that ham with the dogman instead of with him. I felt like she was right. That made sense under the circumstances. If we couldn't do anything to help that dogman, we were probably going to be next. But since I really couldn't think of any way to help him, I figured we'd better get out of there quickly and make our way back to the relative safety of that official campground. We started packing what we could, planning on leaving the tent where it was. I wasn't sure what we'd do when we got back to the campground, but I knew we'd have a better chance for survival there. As we climbed out of the tent, we witnessed an epic scene with our naked eyes. The Bigfoot lunged forward with a one-armed spear attack and just missed. The dogman landed on top of that stick, cracking it in two and throwing the Bigfoot off balance. Once the Bigfoot fell, that dogman was on top of him, with the two of them fighting in the dirt and brush even more insanely than before. I could hear that dogman snarling, and I could hear the Bigfoot whimpering and protesting. The dust rose around the two of them, and the term fog of war popped into my head. As I watched the battle for a while, I was barely conscious that Diane was breaking our tent down by herself in the dark. When I saw what she'd done, I asked her to marry me on the spot. I still can't explain it. The dogman and the Bigfoot were making sounds in the background that nobody should ever have to hear. The dust they were raising was making both of us cough. And in all of that, seeing that Diane was actually getting constructive things done, I realized that she was the one I was going to marry. I remember that when I proposed, she laughed at me. Then she thought about it and said, Yes, but only if I get to pick out my own engagement ring. Diane's a better negotiator than I'll ever be. So the Bigfoot got up and ran away with our protector chasing him. We departed in the opposite direction, and neither Diane nor I have even had one single other cryptid story ever happen to us again. Diane's sister lived in a haunted house in Massachusetts for a while, but our weird experiences ended when we walked out of those woods over in Wisconsin. We have gone on short legend trips a few times since, but nothing interesting ever happened. The thing is, 
when you get to see a show the likes of which Diane and I saw, you can't really go around expecting an encore. We consider ourselves plenty lucky to have survived what happened to us, and to both be able to proudly say... <laughs> Dogman saved us from the tool using Sasquatch. With joy and gladness, we greet you here. Your presence brings us all good cheer. Your smiles and wave will stir our souls, and you are welcome back to the fold. Please join us in welcoming back Alan Bryant, who just rejoined our channel memberships. We're always happy to welcome former members back so we can share with them our weekly Sunday secret uncensored members only stories. Here to tell you more about it is our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank? Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary, scary, scary stories. stories.